Okay. What I wanted to talk about today is basically or mostly work that is based on work that was done by one of my MSc students, Tara Koopman, for her thesis. And after she followed my course on Bayesian networks, she said, okay, I want to do something with explanation. And of course, explainable AI is getting more and more attention and people want to work on that. Her idea was, can I do something with explanation in Bayesian networks? And Basically, what I'm presenting today is the result of that. So it's not about one particular application, but it's about providing explanations for Bayesian networks. And in this case, I'm assuming we all have discrete variables. So I'll start with a bit of a context and motivation and explain what we mean by persuasive contrastive explanations and very briefly about how we uh, compute those from something that we have coined an explanation lattice and also give an idea of interactive uh, explanations that we propose to use with the user. Basically, what Tara started with was a paper that is now cited uh, very often from Tim Miller, and he looked at explainable AI from a social sciences perspective. His idea was, okay, all those AI people are now interested in explanation. But we from social sciences know a lot about how people explain stuff to one another. So he said it's important for people in AI to realize that, first of all, explanations should be contrastive. So not just explain why P is the case, but also why it is not something else. Explanations are selected. So we usually give only one or two relevant causes instead of all possible arguments to, to support an explanation. And these causes are typically biased as well. Explanations do not refer to probabilities or statistical relationships. That's a tough one when we're looking at Bayesian networks. And uh, explanations should be social. So there's, it should be presented as part of the conversation. So with this in mind, we started to look at, okay, how much can we basically meet these criteria when we want to explain Bayesian networks? So... Generally, when we look at explaining Bayesian networks, you can say there's roughly three types of things you can explain. It's the model itself. So why does the graph structure look like this? Why are certain probabilities the way they are? Explaining the evidence, which is basically a map or an MPE query. An explanation of reasoning, which is, I guess, the type of explanation that gets most attention or has received most attention in Bayesian network explanation research. And that is basically about justifying the obtained outcomes. So what I show here is a, an example network, a child network, which models the diagnosis of congenital heart disease in children. And I just use this as an example. And suppose we are, we would typically be interested in the diagnostic variable, which is called disease here, which has the green histogram. And I have evidence for some of the four of the observed nodes. And suppose this is the prediction I get from the model. So we have one value that has clearly got the highest percentage. So this is the most likely disease given the current evidence. And often this is just the explanation that is given. So one of the things was, okay, contrastive. Be contrastive in your explanation. So the previous, the histogram would be some kind of an explanation of why the most likely outcome is, or what the most likely outcome is. But if we now look at machine learning, explanation in machine learning, what has been done there, especially in trying to explain black box, the outcomes of black box models, they have been looking at contrastive questions. So why is the model predicting some outcome? T instead of some outcome, T prime. So it's a targeted question. You're not just ask, okay, why did I get this outcome instead of something else? It's why did I get this outcome instead of one specific other outcome? And in machine learning research, it was proposed to use counterfactuals, although the term counterfactual, counterfactual is abused a bit because counterfactuals usually refer to causal relations, but here it's not necessarily causality that it refers to. So it's just a counterfactual is what change in input would be necessary to get a different outcome? How does my outcome change from what input features need to have different values? 
with this going on in machine learning and looking at Bayesian networks where these kind of this type of explanation was at that time not used yet, Tara thought about, okay, uh, let's try and use these kind of contrastive counterfactuals for explaining Bayesian networks. So we're now assuming, as I said, it's an, a non-causal situation. So we just assume that these inputs are observations and not interventions, and that our outputs are predictions and that the question is targeted, specifically interested in an alternative T prime as average. And because we're looking at Bayesian networks, we want to refer to a single outcome. Uh, we're now talking about the most likely. So if we want to explain and use counterfactuals in Bayesian networks, basically what we're looking for is we want to, well, on the one hand, persuade the user that in fact are the prognosis or the, the prediction T is the correct one given the evidence as well. That's what the model says, but also to provide alternative context. So combinations of observations in which the expected outcome T prime would have been returned by the model. So this slide basically defines the components of our contrastive, persuasive contrastive explanation. It has two ingredients, basically. One is what we call a sufficient explanation. This is also known as a prime implicant explanation. And basically, this is just a subset of what you have observed that would already be enough to conclude T. So I've got some evidence for some variables and Actually, the other variables that I observed, the values for those don't matter because the subset is already enough. And the counterfactual explanation is basically for, again, some subset of the evidence variables, so the variables for which I have observations. But now what combination of other values of these would make me conclude something else? So those are the two, two ingredients we're looking for. Sufficient explanation is the subset of what we have actually observed that would be enough to conclude our current most likely outcome and the contrastive or the counterfactual explanation, sorry, is the subset of evidence variables, but then different combinations than the ones we actually observe that would give us the expected outcome instead. If we want to compute this, and I'm not going to be in the, uh, into the details of this, but it is quite complex because we already have an exponential number of potential sufficient explanations, which is exponential in the number of observed variables. If we want to look at all possible counterfactual explanations, in fact, the number of values of these observed variables also play a role. Looking at Bayesian networks this means for any time we want to see if something is a sufficient explanation or account of actual explanation, we need to do inference in the network, which is MP hard. So we thought about ways of trying to make this feasible in practice. And what we now use is basically a very simple breath first search on a subset lattice that we dynamically annotate and hopefully don't have to completely search. And I'm just going to give you an idea of how this works. So what we have is a lattice on our set of observed variables. So suppose we have observations for variables X, Y, and Z in our model, then this would be the subset lattice. And suppose we observe the values X1 for X, Y1 for Y, and Z1 for Z. Then what we would investigate as potentially sufficient explanations is all subsets of the actually observed values. So for the top of the lattice, where the lattice element includes all possible observed variables, currently observed variables, we look only at the current observation. So X1, Y1, Z1, and see, of course, uh, here we already know that we get outcome T. So the next step in the lattice, we see that there's one observed variable missing. So for example, for the lattice element XZ, we check if X1, Z1 would be sufficient to conclude T. And so uh, all the way down to the empty set. And then the 
the further down we go into the lattice, we start at the top. It means the sufficient sets get smaller and smaller, and that's what we want to achieve. So we want to find the smallest one. So every lattice element is annotated with such a potential sufficient set and also a number of pairs, which are basically potential counterfactual explanations. So if we, for example, look at the lattice element with the X and the Y, the Z is missing there. So that means that we look whether different values for Z and the Z1 was the observed one. So Z2 and Z3 are the ones we haven't observed. If we have a three values variable, then those are the two we can test in combination with X1, Y1 to see if it results in the expected outcome. So what every element is labeled with is a pair of what are possible counterfactual explanations in this case. And what is the output that the network would give if these were the observed values for those variables? Initially, these outputs, we don't know them yet because we need to compute them from the network. So initially, you will have pairs where there's an unknown label for the output. And the further we go down into the lattice, the more of these computations we do and the more outcomes we know. And the outcomes could be the same one we had before, in which case it would not be a counterfactual explanation. It could be the one we are looking for. So the expected outcome T prime, which makes it a possible counterfactual explanation unless we can find a smaller one. It could also be a totally different uh, outcome. For example, in the child network, we have at least seven different outcomes. So it could also be something else. And again, so actual outcomes for all these possible potential counterfactual explanations are only filled in once we compute outputs given these combinations of values from our model. And finally, what we label every lattice element with is true, expected, or other. True means that for every pair that we're computing, we find the original output. And that means we're still looking at sufficient explanations. And that also means that there could still be smaller sets that are sufficient explanations. So that means we continue searching through our lattice. If all the outputs of these pairs for our lattice element are the expected outcome, it means we found a, a counterfactual explanation. And we can stop because the further down we go in the lattice, it means the sufficient sets, potentially sufficient sets get smaller, but the counterfactual ones get larger. So we stop as high up as possible in the lattice. And if we get a mix of all different kinds of outcomes, it means it can no longer be sufficient explanations because we no longer get the original outcomes, but that could still be some counterfactual ones. And initially all these labels were empty because we've not done any computations yet, except for the top lattice element, which contains our original prediction. So that's just an, a sketch of how we can try to compute these kind of explanations in a dynamic way without exhaustively or necessarily exhaustively searching all possible combinations. Just an ex to, to give an example here again, Still the same child network with the same evidence entered and the same prediction for the disease. So the most likely one was, what was this PAIVS value. And let's suppose the, the user says, I actually have expected that the TGA value, which is quite unlikely right now, but that would be the most likely one. So let's see if we can find uh, the sufficient and counterfactual explanations for this situation. So we've got four observed variables. I've now given each only one single letter to indicate them. So the H, O, C, X are actually these four different variables. And this is the lattice you would then get. And the search for sufficient explanations starts at the top and basically covers this part of the lattice, computing outcomes for all possible combinations of values associated with those lattice elements. And then we find that a sufficient explanation is that the H variable has value yes and the X variable has 
value oligamic. The meaning is not that important. And what we see is that this is a combination of values with a lattice element that includes the variables h and x. So, we're, so in this case, we're actually done. There are no smaller sufficient explanations. We can do something similar for the counterfactual explanations. And actually, the search for the counterfactual starts in the part of the lattice where we more or less stop with finding sufficient explanations. So we can continue from there. And in the, for this example, we unfortunately do have to search all the way to the bottom of the lattice. And there are three nodes, ultimately, where we find counterfactual explanations. And which is that now it's an explanation in terms of the variable missing. So if we have HOC here, X is missing. So that means we have a counterfactual explanation with the value of X. And here we have another node, which includes O and C. Here it means H and X are missing. So we have counterfactual explanations, including values of H and X. And in this case, even two different ones for different values of uh, X. And the final one, this includes only nodes C, so we have a counterfactual for H, O, and X. And that was only one combination that gives us that. So this is a way to find these counterfactual and sufficient explanations. And basically in every element of the lattice, we need to do probabilistic inference for all possible combinations of uh, values of the nodes not represented by the lattice element and uh, compute the outcome. But we're not really using any Bayesian network properties right here. So basically this model is, this way of computing explanations is model agnostic. We could do it with any kind of model that gets input and uh, computes out. So we haven't used anything specific for Bayesian networks there. I also wanted to show you a bit about our proposal for using interactive explanations with the user. Basically, where we more or less discuss combinations of such explanations with the user. So we first ask the user to indicate the expected outcome. And we then distinguish between two types of explanation. The terms we use here are probably not, not that good, but I took them from a thesis. So this is what she called them. We've understandable explanations, and that basically means that we choose sufficient and counterfactual explanations that are of small size. So typically in this example, we only had one sufficient explanation and three counterfactuals, but for larger models, you get various sets of these explanations, and then an understandable one would only return the smallest ones. And the convincing explanation would return the combinations that for which the, some of the probabilities and examples are given here are very high. We let the user choose what they prefer type of explanation, and then they, they get explanations in terms of just that are based on standard template phrases. And at the end, the, the system more or less reflects on the user's explanations. These steps I'm going to show you an example uh, of what that looks like for this simplified Bayesian network, so this is an adapted version of a network about car insurance. And we simplified it a lot just to, for illustration purposes. And we're in, assuming here that we're interested in the node accident right here. So predicting whether or not the client uh, will be involved in an accident. And while well, all the other nodes here on the outer boundaries can be observed, and we actually have evidence for all those five nodes right here. And so we're talking about an adolescent here who claims to have a cautious driving style, drives an old car, and has less than three years experience. So here's an example of the interactive explanation, stands for system use, stands for user. So the system first tells us what the prediction is. And so based on the given evidence, it now asks the user, what is your expected value for accident? And the user says, I expected moderate accident. And then the system says, yeah, uh, based upon the evidence that uh, it was found that severe is the most likely value for accident. And then it uh, asks, okay, what kind of explanation do you want? The user prefers an understandable explanation, which is understandable. And then we return some combinations of sufficient and counterfactual explanations.
So these are, those combinations, but I'm sorry, are, are given here. And that's just a, a top two of the ones that uh, refer to the smallest set variables. So then the system asks, do you want more explanation? The user says no. And then it, the, the reflecting part uh, comes. So the system asks, on what observation is your expectation for a moderate ex based? And the user says, on the observation that I have a cautious driving style. And the system says, you probably have the right expectation about how that piece of evidence influences the outcome. But in this case, it apparently is suppressed by the other observations. So this gives an idea of how we could include this or in general do a more interactive explanation as Miller suggests is necessary uh, for explainable AI if we involve the users. What we did was we proposed an interactive, persuasive, contrastive explanation and method for computing these as I try to give you an idea of how it works is in essence model agnostic because we're not exploiting the fact that we're doing Bayesian network computations, but it's quite complex computationally because it depends on the size of the lattice and the cost of inference. So this is typically suitable only for low in dimensional input spaces and not for huge uh, neural network image stuff like that. Uh, these are very basic I ideas. So what we need to do is, well, for, first of all, for the purpose of explaining Bayesian networks, also look at how can we exploit things we know about Bayesian networks, for example, monotonicity properties in the model, but also the underlying structures or inference to make the computations more efficient. Look at counterfactuals beyond observed variables and also study the role of causality because maybe it makes more sense just to include counterfactual explanations for things you can really change. So for example, you could try to, in the exam, excellent example, insurance example, you could try to change your driving style, or you could buy a newer car, for example, but there are also your experience. So how long has it been since you gained your driver's license? That's something you can change. Changes automatically at some stage, but it's not something you can intervene on. And then typically we got lots of sufficient and counterfactual explanations, and we want to make sure we select things that make sense. And of course, and this is what we do way too little evaluate the explanations with actual users. Okay, that's all I wanted to share and thank you for your attention.